Friedman, um, who are going to be speaking about uh, the OE policy registry um, and open bench, sorry, bench learning tool. Um, let me just get your um, slides. Oh, oh, no, you've already done it. Awesome. Um, thank you. So um, if we do a quick sound check, um, Leo, have we got you there? Hi there. Can you hear me? Loud and clear. Hopefully, um, give us some. Yes. Um, and here's Jan. Jan. Here, Jan Hello, is here. Everyone. Hi. Great. Well. Brilliant. Um, in that case, with no further ado, I will uh, hand over to you guys for your session. Many thanks. Thanks very much. Um, so, uh, hi everyone. It's uh, wonderful to have so many uh, people joining us um, for uh, this sometimes regarded as dry topic of open education policy. Um, and um, I hope that you're going to find it um, uh, find it quite interesting. Um, I thought um, we could just uh, quickly introduce ourselves. So I'm Leo Harvman. I am a PhD student at the Open University um, and this is very much in my kind of research space. Um, I'm also a digital education advisor at UCL um, which is why I was very interested in Kate's presentation where she was talking about her use of the um, ABC learning design which my colleagues were the kind of um, original developers of. Um, and um, Jan and Javier maybe you guys would like to introduce yourselves. Yes, my name is uh, Jan Neumann and I'm um, working for HBZ with this, the North Rhine-Westphalian Library Service Center. We, are, uh, we provide digital services for the higher education libraries in North Rhine-Westphalia, which is the biggest state in Germany. And I'm also the project manager of the OER World Map project, which I will shortly introduce uh, within a second. Javier. And, uh um, I'm Javier Atenas and I uh, co-coordinate the Open Education Working Group for Open Knowledge and I'm an associate researcher at the University of Barcelona. Okay, so um, thanks guys. So we'll move uh, on. Um, if I can move it on, let me just... Yes, good. Yes. Um, and Jan, you were going to do a quick intro to the OER world map. Yes, um, the OER world map is actually a project which um, has been around uh, for some while. So it started back in 2015 and um, it uh, is being developed by with the generous help of uh, the William and Flora Hewlett Foundation and um, we are cooperating with a small development firm in Berlin which is uh, called Graph Thinking and uh, Felix Ostrovsky and we also cooperated for several years with the Open University um, especially with um, Rob Farrow um, and it was a pleasure to work with him. I'm not sure if he is here today. Um, anyway, um, so um, the aims of the world map are to collect data about the OER ecosystem, about actors and activities. So it's about um, um, persons and organizations, about services, projects, events, all this stuff. And it's a common uh, misunderstanding that the OER world map collects um, OER itself. So that's not the primary aim. You can add um, uh, resources um, to it as well, but it's not a search engine which primarily aims at um, collecting and, and spreading um, OER itself, but it, it looks at the infrastructure before it. And um, it's a crazy a huge scope uh, within the project and um, uh, because it mainly aims at collecting data from from all levels, all sectors from all over the world and um, for sure this uh, scope was too big and we, we learned two things um, out of the um, project so far. The first one is that it's very hard to develop a, a system if you have such a huge uh, user group 
Um, and the second thing is that um, if you collect data, it's very hard to expect that people will contribute it by themselves. So um, there are people who are doing this, but if you want to provide a co comprehensive um, collection, you need um, paid editors. And these two um, lessons learned were being uh, are being addressed in the OER policy registry project, um, which started some while ago. Um, ago. Um, it uh, goes back to an original project from Craig Creative Commons, um, and we agreed with Creative Commons to take over the OER policy registry um, to the OER world map. And um, yes, one of the uh, advantages is that you can connect policies there to all the other data which is already available. And we hired a paid um, data um, editor. Um, Santiago Martin from uh, UCL. I'm not sure if he's here today. Anyway, um, great to work with him and um, we are currently working on relaunching it and we are pretty much advanced so I hope that we can provide a relaunched and uh, an improved version of the registry within the next weeks and we, we hope to finalize it uh, for OER 20 but unfortunately we, we are a little bit delayed but there is um, already something available I can um, post the link uh, uh, to the chat in a second. Um, yes, maybe that's enough for the OER world map and the OER policy registry. Leo, do you want to continue? Yes, thank you. Okay. Um, thanks, Jan. Uh, okay, so um, so with the one of the uh, great things about having um, a policy registry um, uh, starting to collect and um, collate these uh, policy um, documents is as a way uh, for organizations and um, activists and um, OER enthusiasts to really be able to get a sense of what's going on. Um, around them, what, what similar and not so similar organizations are doing in terms of policy. And, um, and so the idea of bench learning is kind of, um, it relates to benchmarking, but it's going a bit deeper that, you, that you're able to kind of learn and share. And this is very much um, in the spirit of the open education community, um, actually, that it's, uh, that, you know, there's sort of a, an element of um, being able to um, see what others have done and kind of remix it. So um, Denise, I just <laughs> seen, seen Denise uh, saying hi in the chat there. Um, thanks for joining us. And um, so, um, so that's what we are talking about when we say bench learning. Um, so bench learning, that's one um, concept that um, you may not be familiar with, but of course we all know what we mean by policy, um, except um, do, do we? really. Um, I think that this is quite an interesting question, especially um, as uh, somebody moving into uh, sort of trying to research the policy space um, when that's never really been my um, uh, sort of focus before. Um, I've been learning about how complicated it is to actually uh, define define what it means. And uh, so here was one um, description of uh, what policy is that I found quite useful. This is a more generic high level one, um, which as a policy can generally be thought of as a statement of intent that describes a problem and broadly outlines how the problem will be addressed. Um, but, you know, these um, authors say there's no single agreed definition. So policy could refer to a proposal, outcome, formal or informal decision, bundle of legislation or positions implicitly taken. Uh, so I think that's, um, that's quite um, salient here. And um, and then looking at some things that uh, authors have, have written about open education uh, policies more specifically, um, this is also interesting because um, from an um, EDUCAUSE um, briefing on seven things you should know about open education policy, um, they said um, open education policies are formal regulations regarding support, funding, adoption and use of open educational resources and or open educational practices. Such policies are designed to support the creation, adoption, and sharing of OER and the design and integration of OER into programs of study. Um, so that's that's uh, one um, pretty clearly expressed view there. Um, and then we also have from um, Coolidge and Allen, 
Um, are we on policies or laws, rules, and courses of action that facilitate the creation, use, or improvement of openly licensed content? So I think that what's quite interesting here is um, the, the, these um, definitions are a bit different, and they both have their own strengths, because I like in the EDUCAUSE definition that they're talking about how um, policy may be addressing um, OEP as well as OER specifically. Although the, the Coolidge and Allen definition is more specifically focused on the openly licensed content, I think what's really interesting there is that they highlight that it, it is not only laws or rules, but also courses of action. So in other words, this could be just simply the way that we do things can also be understood as policy, even though it may not be written down in a, a place that somebody can, can read it. And uh, so another um, angle on the question of policy is uh, sort of what type of policy, the nature of the policy, um, and also what kind of level it's rating at. Um, and uh, a really useful um, tip for which I must thank uh, Igor Lesko was um, that um, these authors talked about policy um, as being a carrot stick or sermon. Um, so in other words, um, a carrot policy is one where um, you are encouraged to do something, you can gain something by doing it. Um, a stick policy is more of a, a, re a regulation, you must comply with, um, with this policy. And a sermon is really more of a, of a call to action. It's more of a like, uh, hey, this is something that we should all believe in and um, please, you know, um, come, come along with us on this journey of doing this thing. And um, so these are all different sort of policies of a different nature. And then also at um, the different levels, when we're thinking about education policy, uh, supranational level. So in other words, um, talking about kind of um, the UNESCO uh, declaration and declarations and the recent recommendation. Um, uh, as a supranational example, national level policies and then institutional level policies are all kind of trying to impact um, they're trying to impact the same kinds of activity, but they're trying to do it very much um, at different levels and, and you know, um, from the sort of macro to the much more micro. And a, a supranational level is much more like calling on, um, calling on states to um, enable action to happen. So that's much more of a, um, you know, a sermon approach to policy um, in a way. Institutional level might be, uh, might be carrot or stick or might be sermon. Um, so I think, and the institutional level is the one I'm particularly looking in my research. So I think that's really, um, really interesting. Um, but in any case, um, bearing in mind the previous um, definitions that I was um, referring to, I think it's also important that we recognize that policy can be a continuous process rather than something that's frozen or captured into a product um, like a written policy document. Um, now that's tricky because um, the evidence of policy that we have tend to be those things which are captured into a document. Um, so um, which I, which I uh, for the policy traces, um, such as we might find through the uh, policy registry. Hi, Leo. Just for Jane here quickly. Sorry to interrupt. Hi, I just Jane. wanted to know that you've moved into the last five minutes. Um, if okay, like thanks, to Jane. About content and questions. Great. Um, Right. So, um, so as we know, um, supranational, supranational policy interventions have um, highlighted benefits um, and calling for increased engagement by states. We've got some national level initiatives and um, we've got institutions where we might have staff that are engaging in different kinds of practices, but we may or may not have uh, policies going on in those institutions. Um, and uh, Jan, did you want to say a quick word about the consequences for the registry? If you can. Um, in any case, I think I'll just um, speed through that bit. So we, what we, this means that what we need to collect for the registry is not absolutely completely clear. So um, at the moment, we're we're constant. We we've been calling for people to provide us with policy documents, but we're thinking about broadening that scope to say, um, you know, tell us about your related activities um, uh, in order to um, to really broaden the, the broaden our understanding of what's going on in, in terms of those um, aspects of policy that may not be written down as a some kind of document. 
Um, and so looking at the um, what we've actually currently got in the registry, um, we have um, quite a lot of strategy documents. So that's interesting. It's more of a, of a, of a strategy level um, focus than actual policy and a, on a more granular level of what you uh, are necessarily enabled to or can and can't do or things like that. It might be more of a like uh, um, institutions intending to um, engage with this or promote this. And um, uh, also, um, we've got some um, policy documents, some legislation, and um, calls for tender, so, or in other words, um, where funding is being made available and, and people are asked to um, bid for that funding. Um, at the policy level, we've got quite a lot of um, national policies currently, um, not as many institutional policies as as we would like, um, and um, a few other levels like sort of multi-institutional, uh, multinational, um, and a lot of state state level policies. Policy scope is an interesting one. So we've been trying to look at the differences between the um, the things that the, the aspects that the different policies focus on, or kind of the angle that they're coming from. Some are dedicated open education or OER policies, um, but also we have quite a lot of educational policies with a, an open education component um, and then other kinds of policies that again have some open education component but um, but where it's not primarily about open education and um, and again there's the um, the focus of the policy what what space is particularly trying to act upon we can see that content is the way in the lead um, and access providing access um, also is um, is very high um, in this in this graphic, so um, so we again um, some of the areas like capacity building um, and pedagogy, um, awareness raising. Um, we we would hope to see, or we would like to see, maybe um, more more focus um, be, being placed on those areas as time goes on. Um, some uh, we've put some links in the slides about um, activities that we did around open education policy for OE week um, and um, it would be be um, maybe of interest to some of you to follow up those links I'm not going to talk about uh, about them um, and we also have some next steps um, in terms of what we're doing with the registry um, about trying to engage people increase the data sets um, work on our bench learn to um, foster the, this um, learning um, amongst members of our community um, about the um, policy development um, and um, conducting research based on the um, the findings that of all of the stuff that we're collecting. Um, again, there's a link there that goes into detail about the relaunching of the uh, work that we've been doing on the policy registry. Um, and we will share these slides so that you can follow up these links. Yeah. Um, so. <laughs> Thank you, thank you, Leo. Uh, uh, it, it's been great. So you, you actually summarized months of work in a few minutes. Just to quickly round up and catch up, uh, we're happy to keep this conversation going on with you. The, the idea of venture learning is also that we can help institutions and countries to build up the policy. We have workshops and we have materials that can support you guys doing that. And if you want, I'm just going to post a link uh, on, on on the chat. Uh, we have two ways to ask you to contribute with your own policies or also if you're just on the idea of, of starting a policy or you're drafting one, you can deposit it. Well, you can do it by logging and registering in the policy uh, registry or you just can fill a form that we can share with you now, you guys. But please talk to us. Uh, if you're looking for good examples or for best practices, just let us know. Uh, we can sit with you and help you to find what you're looking for. And yeah, that's from us. So if Brilliant. Well, thank you all for another fantastic session. Uh, um, talk to us. <laughs> if everyone would like to um, share, you, it would really become a, a very warm round of applause. Um, then um, we will hand over.